My name is Matt and welcome to According to His Word. So According to His Word is cross-centred, Christ-exalting and saturated with scripture. Now the goal of the podcast is that if you are a Christian or not, you will grow in your knowledge and love of God and understand more of the Bible and the biblical world view. Uh, as the name suggests, everything comes from the fact that the Bible is true and God-breathed and we look at the rest of life through the lens of scripture. Now, none of us have gone to Bible Theology College yet, uh, but we have a passion for Jesus and his word, and we want to show you the relevance of it for today, and it has a real effect on the way that we live our lives. So this is uh, the first episode of our new series. Uh, We're looking at the attributes of God, and so today uh, we're doing a series on the Trinity. Um, We've got a special guest here today, so say hello, Andy. Hey, guys. So Andy is back with us again, and we're going to be looking at uh, the Trinity today. Um, And as per usual, we're going to add uh, any particular verses um, at the in the description. Um, I'm going to read from John chapter one, verses one, um, and uh, Andy's going to read from Genesis one twenty seven and twenty. Uh, so Genesis one twenty six and 27 and those are going to be our two main verses today but we'll probably add a few more into the description uh, I'm going to very quickly pray uh, and then we're going to read the scriptures so Father God uh, we thank you for all that you are uh, we thank you for who you are and we thank you God uh, that you are king and lord over all and we thank you that we can serve you through this podcast and we pray, God, that uh, many people will come to know who Jesus is, uh, that will be used by you to bring about glory for your name. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, Matt is not here with us today, I'm afraid, so it's just me and Andy. Uh, Matt uh, is currently ill, so please be praying for him. Um, he needs to rest up, so uh, he's asked me to cover this one about him. So we're looking at the Trinity today. Um, and ironically, we've only got two people <laughs> uh, doing this episode. Uh, but uh, I'm going to quickly turn to uh, Genesis, uh, sorry, John chapter 1. Uh, and could you quickly read out from Genesis 1, 26 and 27 for us? Yeah, sure. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Excellent. Now, I'm going to very quickly uh, read from John chapter 1. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and for him, and about him was not a thing made that was made. So, I'm going to look at the Trinity. I think it would be kind of useful just to start off if we kind of address a few misconceptions about the Trinity, Andy. Like, what, what are you thinking about? Like, what, what are the main misconceptions that you kind of see uh, as, as a pastor, but also as someone who uh, does a lot of evangelism? You, you've probably come into a lot of, say, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons who might deny the Trinity. Uh, yep. So, like, what sort of misconceptions do you hear in regards to the Trinity? First yeah, so there's the explicit denial of of the doctrine of the Trinity, which you do see in yeah Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, um, I think amongst Christians, there's just a lot of confusion, and that means that amongst a lot of other people uh, who might not identify with any particular religion, there's lots of confusion as well. Uh, I've heard even people who uh, would identify themselves as Christians saying, "Well, it means that like God's three parts, doesn't it? You know, like." They've used the word tripartite, which doesn't refer to the the Trinity at all. Actually, uh, that's some, that's something else. That's another kind of doctrine, another te- area of teaching. Uh, so they've understood. Well, that means if 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 God's a Trinity, that means he's three different bits, uh, rather than three different persons, which is uh, a, a more helpful way of articulating it. Uh, and historically, that's how Christians would would speak about it. But uh, yeah, I think it's a lot of confusion. I, I met a Muslim guy the other day. It was really mm-hmm. cool chatting with him. Really nice guy, and we were just talking about uh, talking about various different things from uh, Islam and Christianity. And one thing that he he said was he was like, "Well, you know, like, because you do you believe the Trinity? Like, because is, is it?" And then he was trying to articulate a little bit of what he thought it was. And is it is it? He so he said something to the effect of, 
father, son, and like, like, like angel, holy angel or something, <laughs> is it? It's like, okay, well, that, and that's where people are up to. I, yeah. I think there's a lot of, uh, mm. a lot of confusion and not very much clarity out there. And churches often just assume it. Uh, this is one of the biggest issues there is. Uh, people just assume it and assume that people understand it. And unless you understand it, you can't delight in it at all. Uh, so, yeah. Mm, definitely. And uh, another misconception that uh, I've come across is this uh, sensor. It's just a, like it was invented in AD 300. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, at the Council of Nicaea, um, I spent yeah. a bit of time chatting to Jehovah's Witnesses. As you know, it's a, a little hobby <laughs> I've got. Most people kind of ignore them. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I love chatting to them about Jesus and um, they always say to me like did you know that the Trinity was invented in AD 325 at the Council of Nicaea yeah. uh, uh, and uh, I'm just going to say that's a flat out lie Yeah. Um, there, there are several ways I could say it's a lie for example uh, Ignatius uh, his writings yeah. from uh, like he died in AD 110 was it? Like It's around then they don't know exactly when it was but yeah, yeah. Mm, so that's 200 years uh, before what uh, what's being claimed. Uh, so actually, you know, the doctrine of the deity of Jesus and the doctrine of the deity of the Holy Spirit is far, is far before uh, the Council of Nicaea. Um, yeah. Also, uh, it's, a, it's a biblical thing. Um, we're going to show you, like we read out two passages earlier, we're going to kind of look at those verses and why they support the Trinity. And that's why we'd be convinced, isn't it? Yeah, because mm. of what the Bible says, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, you know, our podcast is called According to His Word, and so every doctrine we have comes from the Bible. Yeah. Um, so, so actually the reason why Ignatius believed this, the reason why we believe this, isn't because it's what some clever guy thought up, it's what's actually in the text. Yeah. And it's not just the New Testament either. That's another misconception. It's an Old Testament thing as well, isn't it? Um, as I nine, for example, as a clear depiction in Genesis, which we read out from earlier. Mm. So, what might be helpful then? And it could, like, what? How could we um, sum up, like, in like maybe a couple of statements, what the Trinity is? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's there's three statements that we commonly used to try to kind of create uh handrails which keep us within uh what the bible actually teaches about the nature of god uh the first statement is that there's only one god uh second statement god is three persons and third statement is that each person is equally and fully god mm. uh, and so those all need to be kind of explained and fleshed out a bit but but that's fundamentally it. There's, there's only one God. God is three persons and each person is fully God. Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I'm just going to take a brief moment to look at one of the... Like, if, if we, shall, shall we uh, do it the way that we kind of did a training gun? So, yeah, sure. So, how, how do we do Do we do it with like expressing the three persons first? Um, yeah, I think we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause, cause I think I think what would be useful is we look at the three persons so we're going to look at the three persons uh, of the Trinity first, mm -hmm. and then we're going to kind of move on to uh, the uh, each person being fully God. Yep. And then we're going to look at how there's only one God. I, I think that's probably the best way of going about it. Um, for, for, for me, um, I like to go to John chapter 1. We see that Jesus mm -hmm. uh, is, is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, he is a separate person to the Father. Uh, John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and for him, and without him was not a thing made that was made. Now I was just going to add a few things there just to break that down. It says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and was God. So what we see here is, first of all, the eternality of the Word. He's not a created being. He just is. He's been there right from the creation, even before the creation. So we, we see he's eternal. We also see he's with God. So we see here like like a like a different personality. Not 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 a different being, but we see a different personhood here. But there, there's a distinction between the word and what John refers to as God. Um, and so we see like a distinction in the persons, but we also see the affirmation of John that the word is God. 
And it says, you know, the word was with God and the word was God. So you've got a distinction, but you've also got a, a, a same, uh, you know, a same being, as it were. So what? So that's right clear from John chapter 1. And we know that the word is referring to Jesus, because in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, And the word became flesh. And we know this as the incarnation, that God became the human being, which is um, the crux of Christianity. So um, that's the first one. Uh, Andy, do you want to maybe look at the Father? Because um, I think it might be helpful. Now, now we looked at so Jesus, so like a biblical grounding for, for the Son. But could we possibly look at the Father? Yeah, absolutely. I just turned away from from that. I, th I think some sometimes uh, sometimes people kind of presume uh, that the Father will cause the Father's God, and in a sense, that's that's a good presumption to make because He is. But the fact that the Bible makes a distinction between the father and the son and the spirit means that we do need to look at what the scripture says about the father there's a text that we might look at later actually in 1 uh, 1 corinthians 8 verse 6 and yet for us there is one god the father and and it, it go actually paul goes on uh, and winds into that text teaching about jesus which parallels deuteronomy 6 4 which is really helpful so we still start to see how jesus is actually uh, Yahweh of the Old Testament but specifically there it's this one uh, God the Father uh, Paul praises the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verse 3 so uh, we see clearly the Bible's pointing towards the Father being God uh, himself yeah mm, fantastic and I'm guessing when we uh, well I say guessing but, but we also see uh, when we take a look at the Holy Spirit mm. is that uh, the Holy Spirit is God as well. So again, in John's Gospel, if I was just to uh, so if I were just to go to uh, John chapter uh, oh gosh, where is it? So I was just it's John chapter sixteen. Uh, it just says here, uh, "Is for your good, for I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you." So actually, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, um, but they don't want him to go away. <laughs> they don't want him to leave. But he's saying, no, no, it's for your good. So we see this isn't like a downgrade. Mm. It's not like they lose yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. And, and get someone that's not God. But so, so clearly they, they, they're getting someone, they're getting God um, still. Um, but also we kind of... Um, see there but but actually he's a counselor and we we see throughout the bible that one of god's actually you know he counsels people he like mm. he helps people he comforts people um other verses that support the trinity uh, sorry the holy spirit matthew 28 you know when jesus yeah. says the father son who baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit yeah so it's he, a bit like the holy spirit is named in the same vein um as the father and the son but also What's really key here is that it says in John, again, in John chapter 16, verse 7, I will send him. This is a person. Yeah. Uh, I, I once had a guy who literally was saying to me that he's just some sort of active force of God. Yeah, and I've had that from a Jehovah's Witness that started to interact with a video of mine online about the Trinity. And yeah, that was that was it. The, the, the Jehovah's Witness teaching is that that the Holy Spirit is just an active force. Uh, and it's fascinating the twisting of scripture they do because uh, they specifically go to that section in John uh, where it speaks of the coming of the Spirit. And they work really hard to try to twist the fact that actually uh, personal, masculine personal pronouns are used of the Holy Spirit there where they're not demanded uh, by grammatical norms, but actually they're used... Uh, they used to communicate the, the personhood, actually, of the, of the Holy Spirit, that just as Christ, the Son, came and was a he, well, actually, the Holy Spirit, who he promises at that point, is going to be a he as well. So, yeah. Mm, definitely. We kind of also see um, as well that, like, in John chapter 3, it almost says that, you know, like, if he, uh, you know, like, we, like, we don't see, like, the Spirit blows where he wants to. Um, with Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, and that you've got to be born of the Holy Spirit in order to have eternal life. So this is this is like a, a godly uh, person. So we've got a, a God of. So we've got the Holy Spirit is God, and the, uh, the per he's a person. He's not a force. He's an actual person, um, and he is f bringing people to God, which is what God does. We see this throughout the whole Bible. You know, Romans eight declares that it's God who is the 
the initiator in the salvation process mm. and it's God who is the effective one in the salvation process you know he first of all foreknows then predestines then uh, once he's predestined he then goes on to call then from his calling he justifies from his justified this is all God he you know he goes on to glorify so so we can see that in the Holy Spirit bringing people to be born again so they can believe in Jesus but this is actually further evidence that the Holy Spirit is God mm -hmm. so what might be useful now is to like remember well, actually, each of these is fully God and not part of God. Because you mentioned earlier uh, a misconception that, that the parts... Yeah, totally. Do you want, what, do you want to talk about yeah, person or talk... do you want to talk about Christ there? Either. So, Either. So, yeah, so, yeah. So, so the person so the person's being fully God, not just some sort of like... Yeah, not just like part. a bit of God. Mm. And th th that's a really important thing to kind of affirm because... Have we gone on to the next point yet? Because we've done God is three persons. Yeah. We, that one? Yeah. The next one is each person is fully God. Mm. And yeah, quite often people people think that either there's like three gods, but that's going to be denied by the last statement we're going to look at, which is there's only one God. So there's, there's, there is in no way three different gods. Mm. Uh, but also the persons of the Trinity aren't parts of God. So it, the, the point was not... Uh, that when Thomas fell down before Jesus and said, "My Lord and my God," that he meant, "My Lord and a bit of my God." It, it wasn't. It wasn't that at all. Uh, when we refer to uh, when we refer to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit or to the Father, we're, the, the Bible speaks of, of each of, of them as fully God and refers to them as, as fully God. Uh, but the, the the language of persons is pro probably needs to be opened up a little bit, doesn't it, and discussed because. Mm that that's not something that's directly taken from the text the, the idea the the word person is one that's been used by christians to try to kind of put a hedge around what we think the scripture's teaching when it attributes uh uh relationship uh mm. and role uh within the trinity uh so that the the son is distinct from the father in that the son speaks to the father and the father loves the son and the son glorifies the father and the father glorifies the son mm. or gives glory to the, the son uh, or shares glory with the son john 17 like this so the point is there's, there's a distinction that we see w within the bible between the father and the son and mm. the spirit uh there's a distinction and so we use that word person but when, when we say person we don't mean like you know there's matt one person over there and there's andy of a different mm. substance uh actually that's that's different to what the doctrine of trinity is mm. and a lot of people just try to understand the trinity not through scripture as a revelational kind of teaching something that god reveals to us but rather through squeezing it into their own kind of analogies and that's where things fall apart. So uh, in saying persons, we're not talking about two different guys like me and Matt, because uh, actually the uh, the Bible teaches that the, the son is of the same substance as the father and the spirit is of the same substance. And so when we say there's, there's only one God, that's what we're saying, that, that there's, there's only one uh, substance. Uh, but even the word substance falls apart because then we can suddenly go, well, does that mean we split apart this substance? Well, no, because God's not physical either. Mm. And so uh, these three statements that we're making, we're just trying to mark off what some of what the Bible's saying. So we, we see that the Father loves the Son and sends the Son and the, the Son submits to the Father in, in the incarnation and, and going to the cross and that the Spirit testifies about the Son. We, we see all those in there. These persons are distinct uh, but it doesn't mean that we rip them apart so to make that distinction of personhood isn't to separate them out so to, to make a distinction isn't to separate or to divide in any way but mm. rather to recognize something of what the, the bible teaches about them mm. does, does that help with that yeah of course and, and, I, and i think it's also useful you know uh, we kind of kind of look on to the there being one god in a second and i'm going to yeah, look yeah. at the uh, the famous shema or yeah, yeah. um but but I, th I think what's uh helpful though is, is we kind of like we have to recognize the fact that god is simple <laughs> as as in in terms of like he doesn't need things to survive right in his in his being like like for example me and you we need water uh food 
Um, that being said, I don't think I've had water in years. <laughs> Coca Cola is like my replacement. <laughs> Matt, but, Matt shall not live by water and bread and normal food, but by Coca Cola and sweets and, and jelly, jelly babies. <laughs> <laughs> I have a terrible diet. I actually, just a small off point, I actually had to cover a lesson the other day at school on healthy eating. Oh, <laughs> and I felt like the biggest hypocrite in, <laughs> in the world <laughs> in, that, in that single sense. That single lesson, but um, but actually, yeah, God is not dependent on other things. So if you kind of say, well, Jesus is a part of God, then you're making him what he's not. You're making like like when he needs father, yeah. you know, he needs parts in order to live. Like no, no, God needs nothing. He's self-sustaining. He's self-existent. He's self-sufficient. There's nothing he needs. Mm. He's just is, uh, and I think that's a real helpful use. This, thing to recognize here is that god is in some sense simple there's a simplicity about god about you know human beings are dependent on other things to exist that god isn't and i think it's also helpful to remember as well that uh with the persons that actually um they're united so so not only are they you know one being a substance but they actually uh, receive that the son submits to the father receive the holy spirit glorifies the sun you see them working together uh, and it's a fascinating thing just to see this beautiful yeah. picture throughout the bible of how actually the son does all things to honor the father the spirit does all things that bring honor to the son and it's the holy spirit that's going to be enabling uh, yeah. the, the, the call of god to be glorifying jesus for eternity yeah we see this marvelous outpouring of the of so sort of outworking of the holy spirit's role throughout the entire bible in honor to the son and the son doing all yeah. things to glorify the father's name is you know you know he prays in the bible going like father i've glorified your name and i will glorify it again mm -hmm. you know that's john chapter 12. um so so we see a very united this isn't like a separated <laughs> independent like not working together mm. thing at all is it so yeah i think yeah absolutely. We... so there's like unity of purpose and there's unity of substance of god but also unity of purpose within the persons mm. of the Trinity, yeah, absolutely. Problem there. Uh, probably good. caused by myself. But now we're going to kind of look at how God is one. Um, mm -hmm. For me, the obvious passage is when, you know, in the Old Testament, when Moses says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is mm. one. Um, and Exodus 20, uh, when God says to uh, says to the you know through Moses and he's he giving the Ten Commandments and he says you shall have no other uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt you shall have no other gods before me yeah absolutely so he sees one God <laughs> there's no other yeah and uh, and it's interesting because some people might say well wait a sec what that is is that's the Lord that's Yahweh saying <laughs> These other gods that really are there, who really are something, you shouldn't worship me. I'm the only one. But, but then if we look elsewhere, like Isaiah 44 verse six, the Lord says, "I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no god." So mm. it's fairly explicit and clear, and you see that elsewhere uh, over and over again. There's some great verses in Isaiah in that section that we we go to quite often with with Mormons, and it's like, look, God says before him there was no god formed, and there'll be none after. Like he's he, he he knows no god but himself he is the only true god yeah and so it's really important to affirm that as well there is only one god uh, mm -hmm. so the doctrine of trinity is in no sense that there are uh, lots of gods grouped together uh, it's that there really is only one god mm. uh, another verse from isaiah is isaiah 43 verse yeah. 10 and it says you are my witnesses declares the lord and my servant whom i have chosen that you may know and believe and understand that i am he before me no god was formed nor shall there be any after me yeah it, it, <laughs> there, it, there are no other gods yeah I, I had a chat with a jehovah's witness the other day and he was uh i accept because because what they do is they've uh, twisted John chapter 1, haven't they? Because they, they've made it from being in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, they've changed that to uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. So I said to them, so, so do you believe in more than one God? <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 what, how like, how yeah. can there be a, like, like, how can you say that Jesus is not God, but a God? It says, well, clearly in the Bible there are more than one God. You, but, but, you know, we've got like, uh, uh, that, that God says like, uh, 
you know, you, you shall not worship other gods. And like, that, that doesn't mean they exist. Yeah. <laughs> you, you say, you're saying yeah. don't worship them because they're not real. That's that, that's the whole context. And, and actually, yeah. and he actually goes on to refer to these gods saying they're made of wood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's an important distinction to make that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and I think also what uh, I find particularly intriguing is, is often... Um, I've once had a Mormon argue this. Uh, look, I think it's Isaiah 4, 83, verse 6. Um, and then it says, like, I say that ye are gods, but you shall die like men. And they will twist the Bible to make it say that actually God's saying that these are other gods. But the yeah. context, you know, the context yeah. for that is clearly he's referring to, um, to like, the rulers um, of Is uh, is it yeah. rulers of Israel. Right. And he's uh, saying along the lines of, like, like it's basically going, you're, you're acting like gods. Yeah. But you're going to, the, the very next half of that verse is, but you shall die like men. Yeah. I've given you the role that's, that's like God in that you are judging others. And yeah, yeah you're just going to die like men. Yeah. And so, because, and they go to where Jesus quotes that, don't they, in John? And, and they say, look, Jesus thinks that as well. Jesus thinks that, that uh, really there are lots of gods. And it's like, well, no, because the whole point is Jesus is using that psalm uh, as a way of uh, pointing to the judgment that the Lord gives against his people and those who who are supposed to be his judges uh, and saying even you who are in this exalted position of being like judges was to be like gods uh, you're going to die like men yeah and so jesus is actually dealing out judgment on the people who are rejecting him who are judging him wrongly mm -hmm. fantastic uh, just just before we kind of finish up I, I thought it might be helpful if we give uh just a few reasons why we shouldn't use analogies for explaining the trinity because we've kind of summed up there being one god and we've summed up there being the god is three persons and also that each person is fully god we, we hope that you've seen the biblical mandate for that we have so many more verses i could have gone through but for time's sake we, we've not gone through more we actually had a whole session of this uh, uh, thing we we're doing called training ground which if you're in preston come along this sunday uh we'll, we'll have details on the facebook at christ central preston uh, .co.uk is it .co.uk yeah yeah cool so we've got that information on mm. there which will be up uh, which is going out but yeah. um so come along but uh what we actually we had loads of verses but i just thought we'd just pick the main ones just to sum it up but i think what would be useful mm. is many christians use analogies which are utterly unhelpful yeah, you explaining can, the Trinity. That's it. You can basically choose your choose your heresy. Like if you want to use, <laughs> like, if you want to do an illustration, maybe just consider which heresy you're happy to commit while doing that illustration of the Trinity. Like because actually the illustrations that people put together to try to communicate truth about God's nature, they're almost always well meaning and well intended. Do you know, you know, no, mm. I don't think anybody sets out going, I'm going to put me some heresy together. I don't think that's the point. But they. Uh, I've got two cool quotes. Can I can I read? Yes. Uh, so I tell you off for quoting people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this is old dead guys, so we're gonna let's quote some old dead guys. Uh, one is uh, Hilary of Poitiers. So this is a fourth century uh, writer. Uh, since the work creation uh, being the work, since the work transcends our thoughts, all thoughts must be transcended by the maker. Okay, so all thoughts must be transcended by the maker. So as soon as we try to go to the work, that is the creation, and use created things to teach truth about God, we are going to end up in trouble. But there's there's an even better one by John Brown of Haddington, uh, who's another old dead guy from the 18th century. Uh, and he said this, as God, this is old language because it's old, uh, as God himself hath nowhere exemplified any explication of this mystery of the subsistence of three persons in one Godhead by any similitude drawn from natural things, that is doing an analogy, like saying like God's like a, like a, an egg or like an apple or like ice or something, uh, by any similitude drawn from natural things, it must in itself be very daring and very hurtful and darkening to the truth for any man to attempt it. And I think he meant lady as well there. So it's, he says it's very daring, very hurtful, and it's darkening to the truth when we do that. So actually it doesn't help people. They don't really come to a true knowledge to say to somebody, God's like an apple. What, because there's three bits to it? <laughs> is God three different bits? He's like a skin and like, you know, the, the core. And is, is that what you're really saying about God? Like, th does that... Mm that's not actually how god's revealed himself to us either and so the, i think the best thing to do is to use god's word and to try to 
pull out the kind of central truth which, which scripture gives us so yeah mm. definitely uh, i i had to teach uh, the trinity to uh, my year tens um and i told them the rule of fun and i said if you try to use an analogy to understand the trinity then you've not understood what the trinity is yeah um now there is a sense in which we'll never fully grasp that. I, I, it is a paradox. <laughs> it's beyond my ability to comprehend it. Um, how there can be one God and three persons, and yet each person be fully God. That blows my mind trying to comprehend it. I'm not able to. But that, that reveals mm. God's glory and my fallenness <laughs> uh, in my inability to comprehend it. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, but recognize but people who try to then add an analogy show that they really don't get the free statements of what yeah. the trinity is I think, claiming. I think that's it. yeah um because uh, you always you always end up denying one of them like you always end up denying one of them so uh each one of the statements is each person is fully god and well in an apple it's not that the skin is the whole apple is it it's just the skin somebody says can have an apple they give you some apple skin or they give you a core it's like thanks for that but that's not an apple whereas in <laughs> whereas the doctrine of trinity would understand from scripture that when Jesus was was standing in front of us there uh, 2000 years ago we would have been in the full presence of God that God himself was there in all for in him all the fullness of the deity was pleased to dwell in bodily form that's Colossians 2 mm -hmm. so like uh, there's in no sense uh, just a bit a bit of God there so yeah I think I think you always end up denying one of those kind of statements whenever you do, mm. you do that. yeah and, and like, I'll just give you this is hilarious I, I was teaching um, and I was explaining it. I mean, year 10 saw it as a challenge to try to come up with analogies. <laughs> <laughs> and each one getting more and more uh, weird but by by, yeah. like, by the day. So it started off with your bog standard. What is like water, isn't he? They, they said, you know, he's like ice, liquid, um, gas. So he can be solid, uh, liquid, and, uh, and uh, gas. And so, you know, just like water, it can be ice, it can be water, yeah, yeah. And it can be steam. And I said, okay, that's called modalism because that's the idea that God is appearing as one, but yeah. they're not independent persons eternally existing. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and so, and so, went, right, okay, then it, then it did give me, um, when he, we didn't use the apple, but we used coffee as an example. Mm. Um, and, and so they said to me, well, coffee is like uh, milk, coffee, water. <laughs> and I said again is milk fully coffee they were like no and I was like yeah. so you've just denied that one I was more upset partially actually no I was partially more upset by the sense uh, that milk, that, that, milk in a coffee yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, like uh, and also uh, it, it like not to mention if I were to then add sugar to the mix it would no longer be tripartite so it would completely blow but uh yeah that, that, that analogy out the, but, but the, the point is you cannot come up with one um and I, th I think that much as we laugh at those kind of like you know high school examples right respectfully to so many people who do not actually believe the doctrine of trinity they are often working uh, with the level of nuance that is being employed there, to be honest, and I'll, what I often see is people, people, people just starting with kind of unsubstantiated uh, propositions that they they haven't they they can't actually reference it from scripture, uh, or certainly not take the whole scripture and back it up. So people will say people will say, well, Jesus like Jesus can't be God because God can't die, and it's like right, but you've not take you you've just done a massive jump there you've just gone from uh, a, 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 an assumption there to to another assumption about what the doctrine of trinity is or, or isn't actually there and you haven't considered at all any of the nuance that the bible presents about the incarnation and about how christ is both divine and fully human as well like uh, so I, I i do i do think that i just see a tremendous amount of uh ignorance when it comes to people critiquing the trinity actually so like you know bless those kids trying to <laughs> uh, come up with some come up with some explanations uh but uh you, d you do see it as well and uh within other other religions it's like up upon what grounds can god not be one being and three persons mm. like who, who laid down that who laid down that law i remember hearing a jewish guy talking about it uh and and his point, his point basically from 
uh, from the Deuteronomy 6.4 from the Shema prayer was like, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Look, it says one. Uh, and that means that God cannot be three persons. And uh, and then the, and the person he was chatting with rightly just took him back to where I would have gone back to as well and said, well, you know, uh, Adam knew his wife, uh, held fast to his wife, and they became one flesh. And it's like, how many how many were there there? There was there's one flesh, but but that but there was there were still two persons, weren't there? Mm-hmm. Now that that doesn't mean that we directly correlate the marriage of a man and woman with the doctrine of Trinity. Now that's not the point. The point is that within Hebrew thought there was space for the concept of oneness, which had uh, a plurality within it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I I just I just think people uh, come to this without really wrestling with the with the whole text and allowing all of the Bible to way into it and I, i'm just gonna add on to that so i don't think we went back to genesis did we but we see that in genesis 1 26 when actually it says in god you know singular and he says let us yeah make man in our image yeah so we've got a, you know <laughs> so we've got there like a singular and plurality in, in in the same sentence yeah and i think that's an interesting one because like i think all that we we only can look back on that really uh and say oh that makes sense now in light of the full revelation mm. uh of god throughout scripture so like if if all we had was like the first page of our bibles do you know what i mean like the first 20 the first 27 verses of the whole scripture then we would be we would be left i think going what what is that is that like a royal we is mm. that like a kingly kind of pronouncement let us you know us speak like in third person is it uh, is that like a is that like a divine council of mm. multiplicity of gods? Well, I think if we just have those first twenty seven verses, we might be stuck there, mightn't we? Mm. But yeah, we can look back now throughout Scripture and even like you know Isaiah, uh, Isaiah verse nine, uh, chapter nine verse seven as well. Uh, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. We can look back now and go, oh, actually, yeah, that that makes so much more sense to say, let us make man in our image and our likeness. That that mm. is actually speaking of. Uh, of the triune god mm-hmm. now i just thought it'd be useful just to explain why we're doing this so um, me and matt when we prayed we were like we really want to look at who god is um yeah. and because uh i know you'll tell me off for quoting people but uh, hey but, it's your it's, yeah. this is your, your, your yeah. podcast but, you do what you want but uh, <laughs> I, I was very challenged by um something it was about a couple of years ago and it was a video of um rc sport when he got challenged on like the justice of god and punishing adam with right with, we've already punished adam and like Sproul very quickly rebukes this questioner like, like gracefully, but mm. showing them like actually no, Adam Adam deserved far worse than what he got. <laughs> he deserved yeah. far worse than what Adam got. Yeah. And, and then he sort of and he sort of said like, and the punishment was too severe. He goes, "What's wrong with you people?" And then he goes like, uh, "This is the problem of the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, mm. and we don't know who we are." And, and, and I think that's why, like, that, you know, and I was really touched. I was like, actually, no, people don't know who God is. Christians don't know. People, you know, Christians don't know who God is, uh, what he's like. And it's because they've been, we spoke about this in your vlog the other day, about, because they've been given, like, a watered-down, wishy-washy yeah. uh, false presentation of Jesus. That's yeah. not adequate, doesn't show them. And unfortunately, many Christians don't go to the Bible. Yeah. And I don't say that from a self-righteous perspective because any knowledge I do get from the Bible is purely by the grace of God. Mm. But um, it's because I've not seen a whole biblical overview. So so the reason why I really wanted to look at the Trinity and why we've so blunt on these heresies in regards to it is because actually this is at the very you know nature of who God is and it's from the Trinity that outflows even salvation. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to read, I just want to finish just reading from Ephesians 1. And we see here the working of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in salvation. Yep. Um, and because this is where the gospel originates from, it's from the Trinity. The love of God demonstrates in mankind mm-hmm. through the cross, it originates in the Trinity. And so if you remove the Trinity, you remove the whole gospel. And it just says here, yeah. uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who has blessed us in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, but in which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood for forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory yeah. it's a beautiful working of the father predestining us the son dying for us and reconciling us to god yeah. and the holy spirit being the guarantee and seal of our inheritance yeah. and we see elsewhere in scripture that the holy spirit is the one who opens our eyes to see who jesus is this is yeah. why we're harsh an issue because without the trinity we lose the gospel yeah, that's right and we and we delight in this god as well like that we see who god isn't it, christians are very quick to speak ab about how god is love and then actually when when we look at the doctrine of the trinity we find out that that really really is the case that there's mm -hmm. love from the father to the son and the son loves the father and the father, and the son glorifies the father and the spirit makes known the son testifies the son and this this love that that is that is within God himself that has been since before the creation of the world and that is totally self-sufficient in himself. Like This is what it is for God to be love is not just an expression of what he is outside himself, but also what he is in, inside himself. Mm. Uh, and so this, this is why we love the doctrine of Trinity because, because it allows us to see who God is and delight in him. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that is the end of the episode. And uh, we want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, very massive thank you again to Andy for uh, helping us out today. Uh, I no really problem. Thanks uh, for having me. Your thoughts. Thanks for having me as a guest. Um, so uh, the next episode, uh, we're going to be looking at the holiness of God. Um, uh, so that should be fantastic. Now, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at according to his word podcast at gmail dot com. Or according, and you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at according to his word that podcast and message us there. Also, our podcast is now available on Spotify, so you can listen to us on there as well. Uh, so uh, we're just going to quickly take a moment to pray and thank God for who He is, and and then we're going to say goodbye. Andy, could you quickly pray for us? Yeah, Father, we want to thank you that you've blessed us in the Son that through. The work of Jesus on the cross, all of us who trust in you have now been reconciled uh, to you, we've been brought back into relationship with you. We thank you that your Holy Spirit has given us new life and drawn us uh, to you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you, God, that you've made yourself known so clearly, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We honour you, the only true and living God. Amen. Amen. Yep, so that is, so thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.